Hello everyone, uh, today we're going to be going over some basic concepts related to the fueling process of hydrogen vehicles and also we're going to get some um, hands-on demos uh, to get a better understanding and a better feel for the um, concepts that we talk about in this presentation. Okay, so let's go through um, an overview of the process. Uh, this is uh, a diagram of the different components of a hydrogen refueling station. To the left is the actual refueling station, and to the right we have hyd the hydrogen storage system, which is essentially the um, the vehicle's uh, hydrogen storage system. So that's the vehicle. So when we start the fueling process, the hydrogen here in the left tank is going to start flowing to the right. It's going to pass through this filter, then it's going to pass through some tubes, and then it's going to go through a reduction valve, where its pressure is going to drop. So the pressure in, at point 3 is going to be less than the pressure at point 2. Uh, then it's going to flow through our mass flow meter. Then it's going to go through a heat exchanger where we decrease its temperature. After the hydrogen exits the heat exchanger, it's going to go through a control valve, which is going to make sure that the pressure um, just before the vehicle's tank increases at a specified rate so that the fueling can be done safely. After that, it's going to go through the nozzle and here essentially the um, fueling station ends and this is where the uh, hydrogen enters the vehicle then its pressure is going to drop to the pressure of the vehicle's tank and then more hydrogen will flow in and so on and so forth until the tank is filled okay so in this process um, there are two points which increase the temperature of the hydrogen one of them is here in the reduction valve where we reduce the pressure of hydrogen and the other one is in the tank where we're increasing the pressure of the hydrogen. And I'm going to explain why these two phenomena happen um, in more detail in the next slide. So there are two contributing factors to the um, heat of the hydrogen, to the uh, temperature increase of the hydrogen. One of them is the Joule-Thomson effect, and the other one is the heat of compression. Um, so the first one, the Joule-Thomson effect, says that when a fluid goes through an isenthalpic process, that's a process where the enthalpy remains the same, much like the reduction valve process here, the enthalpy remains the same, um, the temperature is going to change with respect to pressure. Okay. Now, if this um, coefficient is positive in our working condition, then the temperature is going to change in the same manner as the pressure. So if the pressure drops, the temperature is going to drop. If the pressure increases, if the pressure increases, the temperature is also going to increase. So that's for a positive Joule-Thomson coefficient. However, if the Joule-Thomson coefficient in our working conditions uh, is negative, then the um, temperature is actually going to change in the opposite direction of the pressure. So if the pressure decreases, the temperature is going to increase. And for hydrogen, in the working conditions that we're dealing with, the Joule-Thomson coefficient is negative. So when the pressure drops, as in here, the temperature is actually going to increase. Okay. Um, so let's get a bit more into the Joule-Thomson effect. Um, so if we draw a constant enthalpy curve on the TP diagram, the slope of that curve is going to be the Joule-Thomson coefficient. This is uh, from the definition that we brought earlier. See, this is the slope of the TP diagram uh, with uh, constant enthalpy. Okay, so this slope is going to be this slope is going to be the Joule-Thomson coefficient. At whichever point, depending on your temperature and your pressure, you're going to get some slope, and that slope, whether it's positive or negative, is going to say is going to determine whether your um, Joule-Thomson coefficient is positive or negative. So here, we have a positive slope. So we'll have the cooling effect. So when we drop the pressure of hydrogen, for example, then the temperature is also going to drop. Um, here, it's zero. So when we drop the pressure, the temperature isn't going to change at all. And here, it's negative. So when we drop the pressure of hydrogen, um, the temperature is going to increase. Now, this point, where the Joule-Thomson coefficient is zero, is called the inversion point, because it, the slope is positive before it, and then it changes to zero, and then it's negative 
after this point. If we draw, if we draw multiple um, constant enthalpy uh, TP diagrams, so um, this one is at some enthalpy, this one is at um, another enthalpy, a lower enthalpy, and we do this um, for multiple enthalpies, and we connect their inversion points, so the point which, uh, at which the slope is zero, um, then we get the inversion curve, where anything to the left of the inversion curve is going to have a positive Joule-Thomson coefficient, and so it's going to cool as we drop the pressure, so it's going to be the cooling region. And anything to the right of the inversion curve is going to be the um, negative Joule-Thomson coefficient, and we're going to actually get heating, uh, and the temperature of the um, fluid is going to increase when we drop the pressure. So now we're going to go over to Google Colab to do some hands-on demonstrations and get a feel for what the Joule-Thomson coefficient is. Okay, so now we're in Google Colab. Um, I'm going to create a new notebook. I'm just going to wait for that to load. Okay, now that it's loaded, I'm going to click Connect uh, so that Google will um, give me some RAM and disk space to work with. Okay, so that's connected. We have some RAM and we have some disk. Okay, so let's start. The first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to install a library uh, that's, uh, that's really useful when we're dealing with thermodynamic properties. So I'm going to um, type exclamation mark, then I'm going to say pip install cool prop with a capital C and a capital P. To run this cell, I can either press the run button here or I can, um, ent uh, or I can press shift enter. Just going to wait for that to install. Okay, wonderful. So that's uh, installed successfully. And now I'm going to import the library, the cool prop module. I'm going to import the cool prop module from the cool prop library. Okay, and I'm just going to give it an abbreviation, um, some abbreviated name, so that I don't have to write this expression every time I want to um, call this module. All right, so let's shift enter that. Okay, that ran with no problems. So now let's see if cool prop is working properly. So CP, the abbreviated name that I gave before, dot, then we're going to use the props SI method, um, and that's going to give us um, the properties of any substance that we want um, in SI. Uh, so the inputs that we put in have to be SI. If it's energy, it has to be in joules. If it's um, temperature, it has to be in Kelvin. If it's pressure, it has to be in Pascals. And if it's enthalpy, specific enthalpy, it has to be uh, joules per kilogram. So we just want to find something uh, trivial that uh, everyone knows. So we want to find the boiling temperature of water. Okay. So the first argument that we put in is the thing that we want. So we want temperature. So that's what we're going to write, capital T in quotation marks. Then we're going to put a comma. Um, then we're going to give it two properties so that the state uh, can be defined. Uh, I'll give it the pressure. And it's going to be 101.325 pascals, which is the um, atmospheric pressure. Um, then I'm going to give it the equality, so that I can tell the program that it's saturated. I'm going to give it a quality of zero, so we have boiling water. And I'm going to say I want water, so I have to put in the substance here at the end. If I press Shift Enter now, it's going to give me 373.12 kelvins. Um, so if I want to see that in Celsius, I can take away 273.15, and I get 99.9 degrees. So the, um, 100 degrees Celsius, that's the boiling point of water. Um, so now that we know that uh, cool prop is working right, um, I'm going to show you how we can calculate the Joule-Thomson coefficient at any given state. So to find the Joule-Thomson coefficient, I'm going to do uh, I'm going to type CP as before. Then I'm going to say props. SI. Now I'm going to give it the uh, property that I want. I want the Joule-Thomson coefficient, and we remember that the Joule-Thomson coefficient is the derivative or the partial of temperature with respect to pressure. And then I'm going to press Shift backslash. So for me, it's just above the right Shift key, and it's going to give me a straight line. And I'm going to say I want this, the changes of 
temperature with respect to pressure at constant enthalpy. So that's going to be the Joule-Thomson coefficient. Then we're going to give it a pressure. So let's say for hydrogen, um, uh, we could say at, um, I don't know, the working pressures um, in hydrogen are very high. So I could say, for example, at 700 bars. So that's 700 times 10 to the power of uh, 5. And uh, let's say at room temperature, so that's 300 degrees Kelvin. And the name of the substance is H2. So this should now give me a negative number. Because we said that in our working conditions, the temperature of hydrogen is going to increase when we drop the pressure. So this is going to be positive, while this is negative. So the overall sign for this um, expression should be negative. So let's test that out now. Shift Enter. And we can see that we get a negative number here. Okay, so now that we know how to find the Joule-Thomson coefficient, uh, I, want us, I want to be able to draw the constant enthalpy curve that we talked about before so that we can find the inversion curve uh, for hydrogen. Okay, so now we want to plot the constant enthalpy TP diagram. To do that, um, first I'm going to set uh, an enthalpy point. So I'm going to set it at 1 megajoule per kilogram. Um, then I'm going to define a set of linearly spaced pressure points so that I'll be able to uh, draw my diagram. Um, to do that, I'm going to need another library. I'm going to import the NumPy library, and I'm going to give it the name MP here. Okay, and then I'm going to use the linspace method and give it a starting point, let's say uh, 100 kilopascals. Um, let it go up to 60 megapascals. And we want it for, let's say, 300 sample points to get a smooth diagram. Let's check uh, P. So this is the array that we get from 100,000 up to 60 million. OK. Uh, now we want to find the corresponding temperature for each of these pressure points <laughs> and this enthalpy point. OK. To do that, we need coolprop.props si. We want the temperature given the enthalpy and the pressure points. OK, for H2. Let's print the temperatures and see how we're doing. OK, so it starts from about 72 degrees Kelvin. So that's negative 200 degrees Celsius, approximately. And it goes um, down to 63. And it increases in the way also. OK, so let's plot this now. To plot this, we need matplotlib, another library. We're going to get the pi plot module plot as plt. Okay. Now we're going to say plt dot plot. Uh, we want the um, pressures as the x points and the temperatures as the y points, and we want to get that to be plotted. Okay. So now we have our constant enthalpy TP diagram. Let's give it. And the name of the axes. So x label is pressure in. Let's make it megapascals. To make it megapascals, I'll have to leave, and I'll have to divide every single point in here by ten to the power of six, and let the temperature be also in degrees Celsius. So minus one hundred twenty-three point fifteen. Um, so I'll put that in quotation marks because it's a, uh, a string. And then let's give it the Y labels again. Y label, it's going to be temperature uh, for, and the unit is degrees Celsius. To get degrees, I'm going to use the dollar signs here and put, there we go. That should do the trick. And let's put this in quotation marks and shift enter. Okay, so we have the labels we wanted now. And we can see that to the left of the diagram, we have a positive Joule-Thomson coefficient because the slope is positive. Then we get to the peak, uh, and it's zero. And then we get a negative Joule-Thomson coefficient. Um, so let's find also, for every single point, sample point that we have here, we also want to find the Joule-Thomson coefficient. So JT is equal to cp.props. We know how to do this from before. It's dt. D P with H constant 
and we have the enthalpy like four we can copy that from here right from here okay so if we copy that and paste those we should be fine so now we'll get a list uh, of the corresponding joule thompson coefficients for the pressures that we've defined here and this enthalpy okay and it should get to zero at some point around the um, 15 megapascal maybe 18 megapascal point okay so let's print the joule thompson coefficient list okay so we can see it's positive 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 then it gets extremely small here so this is essentially our zero point because we have a discrete number of points we're not actually going to get exactly zero but we're going to get very close then it's going to get negative so here this is going to be our inversion point very close to our inversion point to find which pressure this happens at we're going to have to use one of numpy's methods and it's called arg min that's going to give us the index it's going to say how many numbers i should uh, skip before i can get to the inversion point okay so and to find the minimum point i'm going to have to take the absolute value of all of these so that uh, positive and negative no longer matter and then i'll say i want the minimum and it's going to give me the closest number to zero okay so argument of absolute of jt let's wait for that to go so that's it's, it's at in index 80. so now if i say p and call the 80th index this is what I get. So it's around 16 megapascals, right? If I divide that by 1e6, I can see it's around 16 megapascals, and I can also see the temperature corresponding to that. It is 86 degrees uh, Kelvin, which is approximately negative um, 190-something degrees Celsius. So we can see that we're getting the correct value. Okay, so let's continue. We were talking about hydrogen refueling stations and we were talking about the um, phenomena that make the temperature of the hydrogen increase uh, during the fueling process. We talked about the joule thompson coefficient and now we're going to talk about the heat of compression. Okay. So, um, let's talk first about a chamber that's dispensing gas. Um, so you can think of this as your deodorant. When you're using deodorant, you can actually feel the tank getting colder as you dispense the gas. And now we're going to see why that happens using uh, continuity and the first law. So first we write continuity for a chamber that's dispensing gas. So it's going to say the changes of mass within the control volume with respect to time is going to equal the flow rate coming in minus the flow rate going out. We don't have anything coming in when we're dispensing a gas. We just have a flow um, going out of the chamber. So this is going to be the final form of our continuity equation. Now we're going to write the energy equation. Um, this is the energy inside the control volume. It's d e d t. It's the first law, and the energy of a gas inside the control volume is, can be represented by m u, the product of its mass and its internal energy its uh, specific internal energy. Um, it's going to equal the energy coming in, the enthalpy uh, multiplied by the mass flow rate coming in, minus the enthalpy going out, multiplied by the respective mass flow rate, uh, plus any heat that might come in or go out of the chamber. Um, to simplify the process, we're going to assume uh, that we have no um, heat flow. So that means that we're going to insulate the walls of our tank. We also don't have any inflow, as I said before, so m dot n is going to be zero, and the final, the final form is going to be this. Um, what we've done here on the left-hand side is we've just used the product rule uh, to find this derivative. Now if we take dm dt uh, multiplied by u to the other side, we're going to end up with this equation. And if we substitute that with m dot out and then factor out the flow rate, um, this is the equation we end up with. So m, the mass of the tank, multiplied by the changes of the internal energy of the tank with respect to time, is equal to m dot out multiplied by the internal energy of the tank minus the enthalpy going out of the tank. Okay, um, another assumption that we can make is that the gas that's leaving the tank has the same enthalpy as the gas in the tank. 
This assumption has been made in many references, and so we're going to make it here as well. Now we're going to use the definition of enthalpy to convert enthalpy into um, to convert u minus h into uh, some expression which we'll be able to um, tell if it's positive or negative so that we can see whether the temperature increases or decreases. So using the definition of enthalpy, we can say that u minus h is negative PV. If we, substitu if we substitute that into here, um, this is the final expression that we end up with. du over dt is equal to negative m dot out multiplied by the pressure of the tank, multiplied by the volume of the tank, which is constant, divided by the mass of the tank. Okay, so what, so what can we deduce from this equation? Well, we know that V is positive and constant. Our tank has a constant volume and it's a positive number. We know that P is positive. We know that M dot out is also positive because we've uh, accounted for it going out with a negative here, so this is going to be a positive value. And we know that the um, mass of the tank is also positive. Here we have a negative sign. The rest are positive, so the overall expression is going to be negative. So we can say that the change of the internal energy of the tank which for an ideal gas is representative of the temperature of the gas with respect to time is negative which means that it decreases so we can say that the temperature decreases as time goes on when you have an outflow of gas from your chamber okay so now let's move on to a chamber being charged this is essentially the um, chamber that we're dealing with a tank being charged by hydrogen the vehicle's tank so continuity we have the same equation as before, only this time m dot out is going to be zero. Next, if we go over the energy equation, uh, it's going to be the same as before. We don't, we don't, only this time we don't have any outflow. We're going to assume a diabetic process again. This is the equation that we're going to end up with. Um, and if we take uh, dm dt multiplied by u to the other side again, and substitute and substitute m dot in with dm dt again and factor it out, this is what we end up with using the definition of enthalpy. We can say that U is equal to H minus PV. We'll do that for U, the internal energy of the tank. And this is the expression that we end up with. Now, we're going to have three different uh, scenarios depending on the H in. That's the inlet conditions of our flow. If H in is equal to H, that means if the enthalpy of the um, fluid coming into the tank is equal to the enthalpy of the tank itself then these two are going to cancel out here and we're going to end up with this equation in this equation again if we assume that u represents t for example for an ideal gas then we can see that we have a positive number here m dot n we have a positive number for p we have a positive number for v and we also have a positive number for the mass of the tank. So this expression is going to be positive, so our temperature is going to increase with respect to time. So this is for a time when, for example, we have uh, um, the same pressure as the tank, the inlet flow has the same pressure as the tank, and also the same temperature. Okay, so if the enthalpy of the inlet stream is more than the enthalpy of the tank, uh, this happens when we have the same pressure but a higher temperature going into the tank, um, then again, we're going to have PV plus some positive expression and the whole um, right hand side is going to be positive so, our, the changes, so the changes of temperature with respect to time are going to be positive again so we're going to have an increase in temperature for the final condition if the inlet stream's enthalpy is less than the enthalpy of the tank so this could happen when we have the same pressure as the tank but a lower temperature then um, we're going to end up with this expression now this part of the expression is going to be positive and this part is going to be negative uh, and it's going to depend. If our temperature is so cold, that means that we're putting a stream into the tank, which is extremely colder than the tank, then this entire expression could be negative, and that would mean that the temperature of our tank decreases with respect to time. This is because the, the stream is extremely cold, and although when it's going into the tank, the stream is going to heat up, but still, but still the temperature of the tank overall is going to go down because the stream was much colder than the tank. Okay, so before we get into the final uh, code demonstration, I'm going to explain uh, the fueling protocol. So as I said before, um, we control the pressure of the hydrogen going into the tank of the vehicle. We do this for safety reasons, because as I said before, we have to control the enthalpy going into the tank to make sure that this isn't too high. If we make HN cold, and we make sure that the difference between these two enthalpies is low, then we could dampen the increase of temperature with respect to time and make the fueling process safe. 
So we control the pressure, the average pressure amp rate, and this is going to control the enthalpy going in, and also it's going to control the mass going into, the mass flow rate going into the tank. How is it going to do that? Well, I'll explain here. You see, at the final stage, when the fuel is going to go into the fuel cell vehicle tank, the pressure reduction from the dispenser and the, into the tank is going to, so this delta P, is going to determine our volumetric flow rate. The smaller the delta P is, the less of a volumetric flow rate that we have, and the less flow rate that we have, um, the less increase in temperature that we uh, end up with. All right, so let's go to Google Colab and do the last part of the code demonstration. Okay, so on to the last uh, demonstration that we'll have uh, for this tutorial. So I've prepared this script from before, and I'll just explain it line by line, and then we'll run the script and see the results. So first I'm defining a uh, function which takes in time the initial value for the pressure of the uh, fuel cell vehicle, that's the tank of the vehicle, and the average pressure rate ramp, which we can decide based on the uh, SAE J2601 standard. Uh, so what this function is going to return is the value of the pressure that's going to go into the um, tank. So at T0, this expression is going to be 0, and we're going to have the initial pressure in the fuel cell vehicle uh, as the inlet pressure. As time goes by, the pressure is going to increase linearly according to the APRR, and so this is how the pressure is controlled at the inlet of the um, tank. Now I have a second function, which is for the calculation of the flow rate. Okay, so what this function is going to do is it's going to calculate the flow rate based on the um, pressure drop in the tank. Um, we've modeled the pressure drop using a valve model and uh, this model takes in the inlet pressure to the tank, the pressure of the tank itself, so that's P, P underline O. Um, it takes in the inlet temperature. It takes in the um, constant associated with the um, pressure drop, so this constant de uh, decides what pressure drop we have in the tank. So the higher the pressure drop in the tank, the um, higher this constant is going to be. And finally it takes in the outlet row, um, which is uh, in this case the uh, density of the tank. Um, for this formula, um, as I said, the delta P has to be in bars, so when I um, find the difference between the inlet and outlet pressures, I have to divide it by 10 to the power of 5 to find the um, value in bars. Um, then it's going to find the inlet density using the inlet temperature and the inlet pressure, which we can find using the, uh, the p-inlet function. And then uh, it's going to take in kp from the, inlet, uh, from the input to the function, uh, and it's going to calculate v-dot. Once it's calculated v-dot using this formula, um, we're then going to uh, divide V-dot by 3,600 because V-dot is in meters cubed per hour and this is going to convert it into meters cubed per second. Then we're going to multiply it by the outlet density, which in this case, as I said, is uh, the density of the tank. Um, and finally, this function is going to return the flow rate. All right, so in this cell, we're going to initialize our values and prepare the uh, script uh, for uh, the main body of the code, which is going to do the uh, calculations and the simulation. So the initial pressure of the tank, uh, we're going to assume is 2 megapascals, so it's not completely empty. Uh, we're going to assume that the initial temperature of the tank is 25 degrees Celsius. And also we're going to assume that the volume of the tank um, is 150 litres or 0.15 cubic metres. Um, at the beginning, we're going to assume there's no flow rate and no change in the en energy of the tank. Um, and once we've initialized these values, we can use them to find the um, internal energy of the tank and the mass of the tank. So we'll find the internal energy using the cool prop and the, init uh, the initial pressure and temperature. And we can find the mass by multiplying the, um, the volume 
by the density which we've calculated here. Then we set a um, time step for our simulation and we set the time to zero at the beginning of the simulation and we initialize the pressure inside the tank to P initial. Okay, so let me just run this. Let me run the functions. Okay, so we've defined the functions here, initialize the values, and we're going to initialize these arrays. What are these arrays? These arrays are just for storing the values of m dot and time at each time step. Okay, so I have the main body of the code here, and I've started my code with a while, and uh, this means that this code is going to loop through, it's going to iterate, uh, until um, this condition is no longer true, which means that the pressure of the fuel cell vehicle is no longer less than 700 bars, um, and the vehicle is now charged, okay? So first, I'm going to find the value, the current value of u using the old value of u and um, du dt. Then I'm going to do the same for. Um, then I'm going to do the same for mass. So I'm going to update the mass inside my tank using the mass flow rate and the um, mass inside the tank from the previous time step. Then I'm going to find the density in my tank using um, the mass that I just found and the volume of the fuel cell vehicle, uh, the fuel cell vehicle's tank. Um, then I'm going to find the pressure using the um, pressure function that we defined. And I'm going to do. Uh, I'm going to use uh, an APRR of 28.2 megapascals per minute. And in here, if you look, I've converted megapascals per minute to megapascals per second, and then I've converted it to pascals per second. So the outlet of this, the output of this function, is going to be in pascals, um, so as to be um, consistent with the rest of our code. Then I'm going to calculate the flow rate using the pressure loss model that I defined from before. I'm going to input the uh, inlet pressure to the tank, the pressure of the tank itself, um, the temperature I'm going to set at negative 40 degrees Celsius, um, and this is based on the SAEJ 2601 standard again. This is the constant that I've chosen for the pressure drop model. Uh, you can uh, find these constants and the effect that they have on your model uh, from this um, reference. From this reference. And finally, I've uh, given the row that I calculated here as an input, as my final input um, for the pressure drop model and that's going to calculate my flow rate. Then I'm going to calculate the inlet enthalpy using the inlet pressure and the inlet temperature again. And using that inlet enthalpy and the mass flow rate, I'm going to calculate the changes of U with respect to time. I'm then going to store my time and my mass flow rate using the append uh, method in NumPy. And then I'm going to update my time and I'm going to start all over again. Okay, so if we run this, and now we can see how long the entire process took um, to fill the vehicle from 2 megapascals to 70 megapascals or 700 bars. So it took 145 seconds, approximately 2 minutes and 30 seconds. Um, and if I want to plot that, I can use my arrays and press shift enter. So I can see that my mass flow rate increases over time and then uh, it reaches a peak and then it decreases. If you play around with the um, pressure drop constant and the um, if you um, don't assume the process to be adiabatic, um, then this will change. Okay. And I can use the MP and the NumPy Amax method to find the maximum um, flow rate. So in this case, it's above 60 grams per second. But um, when you're doing this yourself, you can play around with the heat flow to the tank and the um, constant uh, to um, make sure that it drops the peak of this um, mass flow rate uh, diagram below uh, 60 grams per second, so as to comply with the SAEJ uh, 2601 standard. So another thing that we can do is plot um, 
the temperature inside the tank um, versus time, so that we can actually see whether it, uh, so that we can actually see it increasing and check that it doesn't uh, exceed the 85 degrees Celsius limit set by the SAE J2601 standard. So to do that, we're going to have to find the temperature first at each time step. So to find it, we're just going to use the same function as we have here, call prop, just change T to P. Uh, and we're going to have to create an array here. So T array is equal to an empty NumPy array. Run that. And we're just going to have to store um, the T like we did with the flow rate and the time. So it's going to be T array. And this is going to be T of fuel cell vehicle. And this is going to be the the T of the fuel cell vehicle and this is going to be the um, T array again. So this is just going to append it every time that we run this piece of code in the while loop. So if I initialize my values again and run the code, this time I'm going to get another array called T array and I'm going to use the plot function and I'm going to plot time the T array as my x axis, sorry, time, and I'm going to plot the temperature array as my y axis. And we can see that the temperature inside the tank increases um, until it reaches 300 and, uh, approximately 352 uh, degrees Kelvin. Um, to see that in Celsius, we can take away 273.15 to find the Celsius. I have to put that inside, and if I run again, yeah, we can see that it reaches just before 80 degrees Celsius. Um, so we're safe here, but it would be um, best to include the heat loss to the environment. Uh, would be best to include the heat loss to the environment um, expression here, and not assume an adiabatic um, process, so that our results would be much closer to the actual process. So now that we have our code, we can play around with the initial values. So let's say I have a half full tank. Let's say I have a tank which has 45 megajoule, which has 45 megapascals in there already. And maybe it's not at 25 degrees Celsius. Maybe we're in a hot city and it's at 35. And you can play around with these values and see what effect they have on your fueling time and on your flow rate and also on the temperature of the tank. So let's just wait for this to initialize. Okay. So let's initialize. And then we're going to run this. And now just a final note. When we're calculating the inlet pressure for the um, tank, sometimes due to the um, round-off errors that uh, accompany numerical calculations, uh, the um, inlet pressure might be less than the outlet pressure and that would result in a, a negative number under our uh, square root here. Um, so just to make sure that that doesn't happen, um, what we could do is we could take the absolute value of this pressure difference and that way we can make sure that that error doesn't happen. So if I press shift enter now, shift enter now, and I press and I change my initial pressure to 45 megapascals and I initialize it there, I can run my code and I can see how long it took for the fueling. So I can see it takes less time, it takes less than a minute this time and I can see what my um, plot looks like and I can see that this time the peak is much lower than the um, 60 grams per second that we got before. So it's 20, 28 grams per second now. And as I said you can play around with the initial temperature and the, um, as I said, the initial um, uh, charge of your tank, the initial pressure. So thank you for listening to this tutorial and I hope you have a great day.